My name is Keith Kelso. I work at Michigan Sugar Company. I'm the Agricultural Operations Manager. In my position, I work with all our harvest systems that our growers have. I work with logistics and moving beets around from field to field and from factory to factory. So today we're talking about harvest and uh, what we can do to improve on our harvest, if anything. Our growers do a great job of, of planting and taking care of excellent high quality crop. They do a great job of harvesting, but there's always something that possibly could be lacked or something that could be improved on. These beets can be prepared for long-term storage so that once they get into the pile, they can store, we can cool them down, they can store for as long as we need them to. The soil is, is something that really impacts. It's harder for us to, to pile the beets and it's much harder for them to store. When we talk about defoliation, here's a beet I just pulled out of the row and they're doing a real good job today here again. The, the topper is going at a fairly slow pace and you can see the quality that he's got here of this crown. It's, they've got three drums of rubber flails on their machine and they just cover cover the crown and the crown's intact but you see there's very little well there's really no green no petioles no leaves whatsoever if we can have this high quality of a defoliation job we're going to probably see better storage conditions because when we have petioles or leaves intact that's the part of the beet that wants to survive and grow of course we have energy in the root and that energy goes and produces leaves those leaves if they're in the pile and they grow which we see occasionally they will produce heat and then it will cause more to grow and then we get a, a situation that expands that we don't like to have. So we leave the, all the green in the field, that's ideal. So these things are very important for the long-term storage so that when we put our beets in our piles, they can store three, four, five months down the road and uh, give us a high quality crop, give us a very good beet payment and make the most sugar that we can make. Hi, my name is Mike Richmond. I am a co-owner of Richmond Brothers Farms and Richmond Brothers Fabrication along with my brother Ken. We've been farming all our lives with uh, our mom and dad and, um, and we have about 900 acres of sugar beets that we grow and then we have a fabrication shop that we have been into the sugar beet harvesting equipment repair part program for over 20 years. Um, today we want to look at a conventional harvester. This is a 12 row 22's alloy beet topper that um, is in a, in a field today. We want to explain to you a little bit about how to set it up. Um, first of all, the back drum is always the most important. That's the one that has to be in the best shape, has to be in the right position. The front drum is the second most critical and the third, the second drum is the third most critical. The back drum is the finesse, we call it the finesse style drum. Front drum is going to take the heavy foliage off. You always want to keep it about an inch, inch and a half above the crown of the beet to take the heavy foliage off. The middle drum will come across and take another section of leaves off. And then the back drum will do the finesse or the cleanup. So the back drum always turns in reverse and it always pushes the leaves forward. So when it comes to, to topability of a beet, not only does variety take it into consideration, but so does weather, um, heat, temp, uh, uh, wetness of the leaves, dew, it all plays a part in it. So if you are topping the night before and it's set up perfectly, doesn't mean the next morning it's gonna, it's gonna work that way. Whole idea of, of doing a good job of defoliating is to, to make sure the crown of that beet is protected, but yet is defoliated. And how we do that is, for instance, this beet topper, most, most conventional toppers are set up four bar flails in the front, four or six in the middle, and six in the back. What we do is we switch them all to an eight bar system, gives us that many more flails underneath of that topper to do the job. That allows us to reduce our RPM. And so instead of RPMs being up around that 2000 mark, we're closer to the 15, 1600. When you do that, you, you are doing a lot better job of keeping the crown of the beet intact. You're not bruising and harming the beet. And that'll help us for not only sugar content, but for long-term storage, which is our ultimate goal. Um, the other thing is, is when you reduce that RPM, not only are you saving fuel, 
but it's a whole lot better for your flails. Your flail efficiency and your flail wear goes, goes down dramatically when you reduce those RPMs. When you go from 2,000 to 1,500, you'll get almost double the life out of your flails. And it doesn't matter what kind of flail or any manufacturer, it'll all do the same. So when it comes to the defoliator, you want to make sure that, that the defoliator is always set properly. And one of the biggest misconceptions about a defoliator, if it's not doing a good job of topping, you want to lower it. Well, a lot of the times, what we have found is that's not always the case. Sometimes when you get your topper too low, it actually will do a worse job because in the back drum, for instance, if it is too low and it's hitting the ground, it'll hit the ground before the beat. So the flail actually will do this and it swipes across the beat instead of the tip going across the crown. And it'll, it'll wear your flails out in, in a lot fewer acres, plus it will not top the beat very well and it'll do a lot of bruising and damage to it. So when, when it comes to a poorly topped beat, first reaction is you always gotta let the topper down. Not always the case. Sometimes you gotta lift it up what we like to do is we keep lifting it up until it's not doing a very nice job and then we start lowering it until we get the perfect job. So for instance, today we're in a field that is a 22 inch rose, but they're thinner. These are like 180 count beats. So you got all different sizes and you can see here that we've been doing a pretty good job of, of topping the small ones and the big ones and yet we haven't knocked any out and we're not harming the crown of the beats. Hi, I'm Ken Richman. I was asked today to go over the, the tuning of a beet harvester, and that's where we're gonna start. I'd like to start on the front of the harvester with, with the lifter wheels. Um, we, we plant 22 inch rows, so we like a nice tight pinch point. A wider row beat, a 30 inch row beat, you can be a little bit wider. We, we, in narrow rows, if you have thick beets, we like to be somewhere around an inch and a half to inch and three quarter. If you're in wide row beets, we like to target inch and three quarter to two inches. And we're talking about the narrowest point of where the two lifter wheels come together. That's what we're talking about. Now, for anything more than that, when you're digging thick beets, you will leave beets. So what we like to do is we like to get that pinch point just as tight as we can get it. We also want to talk about the paddle shaft and make sure that the paddle shaft rubbers and your paddle shaft speeds, everything is adjusted properly. We want to make sure the rubber on your paddle shaft is in good quality, especially in mud. That'll help keep our lifter wheels clean and keep mud from going through the machine. Um, Another really important thing is our row finder. Um, we try to adjust our row finder so that it's, it's accurate. It makes your day so much nicer if, and, and less, a whole lot less fatigue if, if your row finder works good. Um, th this is a row finder finger. Um, I like to adjust my row finders once so it's so it's fairly responsive, but not too responsive where it throws the machine out of the row. So when I'm usually running my, my, my harvester, I'll try and set so that the, the beats are actually hitting the backside of the finger and not getting the row finder so deep that it steers on the front part of the finger and throws my harvester out. I like to have a little bit of angle when it comes through the ground so that I'm sensing off the back of the finger. The other thing I see a lot is I see a lot of other harvesters that have their fingers too wide. When, when I run my row finder, I'm, I'm in narrow rows. I like it to be four inches, three and a half to four inches. Um, it used to be where you used to cultivate your beets and you would take your row finder and set it to a ridge that your cultivator made. But now nobody cultivates anymore. So what we like to do is we set it right on the crown of the beet and we put a lot of pressure on our tines. 
Um, some guys say that you'll, you'll have leaves ball up on your tines, but usually if the topper is sweeping them out of the way, it's not a problem at all. But I like to put heavy pressure on my tines so that, that the tines are sensing the beet crown all the time. And that's really critical. When you get into thinner beets, it can be a little bit of a challenge, but thicker beets, you put the, put the tines down with a lot of pressure and you won't have any problem. Usually you can hook the first part of the row and it'll stay right true. So it's very critical on the row finder to make sure you have heavy tine pressure to the beet and also to make sure it's centered and make sure it's responsive. I'm asked to talk about ground conditions um, from dry, I wanna call it dry to normal conditions to muddy conditions. Normally when I'm digging, and I, let's say I'm in dry conditions, I normally try to dig as deep as I can, but yet pull the harvester. And normally in dry conditions, I'm trying to get as much dirt through the lifter wheels and through the first stage of the harvester before the dirt falls out so that I can force those beets back to the back side of the harvester. It won't be a problem to clean the beets because there's there's not there's no stickiness to the dirt. So they'll come out in the cleaning rolls. I also sometimes in dry conditions, I will lower my RPM. I'll lower my RPM until I can see the beets having issues trying to walk up my harvester. But as long as my flow is good through the harvester, I will look, keep the RPM as low as I can so I don't do as much damage to the beet as I can, try and not break the roots off. In dry conditions, you won't have any lubrication of mud, and that's a big deal because you don't have any lubrication to stones. You'll have quite a few issues with grab rolls, bending, different stuff like that, where if you lower the RPM, they aren't hitting, the stones aren't hitting quite so hard, and you're not doing as much damage to the beet. On the wet side, when we have muddy conditions, I like to dig as shallow as I can, but yet dig all the root. And what I'll do when I run my harvester is I will, I will shallow my harvester up until I see white of broken tips going through my harvester, or I'll look in my bin and I'll see broken tips, and I'll start lowering my harvester until it goes away. That way I know I'm at, is, I'm just as deep as I can get, but yet I'm not breaking the root off. And when I dig in, dirt, in muddy conditions, I'll run uh, wide open. I'll run full PTO speed, trying to get as much speed to the grab rolls as I can. You don't have to worry too much about broken beets because you have the lubrication of the mud. You wanna do as much mud removal as you can. So I run it wide open when I dig in muddy conditions. We have, we have two different styles of grab rolls. Um, the, first, the first style I wanna talk about is what they call conveying rolls. So when grab rolls are turning the same direction, they're called conveying rolls. This harvester right here has two styles of, of rolls. It has conveying rolls and it has cleaning rolls. Normally a conveying rolls will all turn the same direction and all be wrapped so they'll be all grab rolls. And all the purpose of a conveying roll is is to move the beets in a certain direction. Of course, they'll remove a certain amount of, of mud, but they're trying to make a flow through the harvester to put them in a certain area. Normally, in a certain area, that starts onto the cleaning rolls. When we go to talk about the cleaning rolls, a cleaning, the cleaning bed usually has a grab roll next to a smooth roll so that it grabs the beets and clean some mud off. And normally the grab roll will turn one direction, smooth roll will turn, turn the opposite direction. There is certain conditions when we talk about cleaning beds and certain harvesters where they have, um, we have rotation uh, reversing kits that go in the cleaning bed. So you can actually reverse the smooth rolls. If you get super dry conditions, it's nice to reverse the smooth rolls and not clean them and actually just send them through. There'll still be no dirt, but you don't want to break up the beets. But normally, in normal to wet conditions, you always want to keep your grab rolls turning against each other. 
when uh, we talk about adjustments of the grab rolls, the conveying rolls themselves, all you want to do is center them. You want your rolls centered. So whatever gap you have in between your conveying rolls, they should all be the same. When you talk about cleaning rolls, you always want, you always want the cleaning rolls at the pinch point where they're coming together. You want that fairly tight. You want it within a quarter of an inch, but yet if the rolls are straight, you don't want them to, as long as they're not bent, you don't want them to hit. If you're on, as long as you're on the pinch point, you'll save all the little beats and you'll do a good job of taking out mud. On the upswings, you don't care. You don't care how big that gap is because the beats will always be, be forced up. Where on the pinch side, when they're, they'll always be forced down. So we like to take our, our cleaning bed and make sure we're tight on the down swings, as tight as we can, because we're narrow rows, we wanna save as many little beats as we can. If it gets wet, you can spread that apart a little bit and it'll take out more dirt, but it's always best if you have like thinner beats, if you're wide rows, if, um, if you have bigger beats, you're late in the year, so you don't lose little beats. But for us being a highly populated, narrow row type farm, we like to tighten the pinch points as much as we can on the cleaning side.